Hello, everybody. Good morning. So this picture I took a couple years ago. I was standing at the sink and literally had been picking blueberries. Oh, that's the magic space you can't go in. I'd been picking blueberries, standing at the sink, cleaning them up. And I see this picture, literally. And I get super excited and call my husband, Ole, come look, this is really cool. Isn't this great how this picture completely captures how difficult it is to identify the septic patient? <laughs> and he looks at me and he's like, Lisa, that's a red berry right there in the middle, and the rest are blue. And exactly, that is exactly my point. The red berry, we will never miss the red berry. This is an overtly unstable patient. You don't even need medical training to know that this person is really sick. These blueberries, these other berries amongst all our patients in the emergency department, that's our problem. How do we identify these septic patients? And this is something that I have given a lot of thought to and something that my research has been focusing on. So there's some very important questions, I think, in sepsis. One is, how do we identify the septic patient, which I just tried to illustrate here. And others are that sepsis is not a very narrow one condition. It's a syndrome. The patients look different, they have different prognosis, they require different treatment. And, um, and this leads us to the question of, should we be doing this differently? Should we be grouping them? Should we be individualizing their identification, their treatment, and hence their prognosis? And so my main message to you today is that we need a combination of well-defined clinical cohorts and applying cutting-edge technology to be able to answer these questions. So my name is Lisa Kurland. I'm an emergency physician. I'm a professor in emergency medicine in Örebro. And I'm going to give you a brief introduction into sepsis and then move on to talk a little bit about some of the studies we've been doing and identification of the septic patient. And then back to an introduction to Erik Malmström, who will be talking after me. Okay. So what is sepsis? So I put up these two words. It's, it's, I think, important to understand this as a concept. The definition is our understanding of the condition of sepsis, our understanding, which means the sum of our scientific knowledge. Where are we? What is our knowledge in relation to sepsis? Well, the criteria are something like, kind of like a checklist, something we as physicians will use to tick the boxes and say, this patient has sepsis, but this does not. And these are the three landmark studies that all emergency physicians have to have read and relate to. Uh, Bone was the early one. It was based on consensus. And one, that's the first one, followed by Levy. And again, was challenged. One considered biomarkers, yes, no, ended up being no. Nothing really changed in relation to definitions. But there was a major change in Singer 2016. Here, in addition to consensus, they did other studies, much more literature reviews. They did Delphi's, but they also looked at clinical cohorts. And hence, because of the chronology, and you recognize this, they're called sepsis 1, 2, and 3. And so currently, we're operating under the sepsis 3. And now I'm talking about the definition. So what is, what is or was our understanding of what sepsis is or was in the field? And early on, back in 1992, it was inflammation. That sepsis is called by a systemic, uh, caused or is a systemic inflammatory response to infection. And again, this was challenged um, approximately 10 years later, but remained unchanged. And again, 2016, something different happened because we had a broader, a broader understanding of the field. It wasn't only inflammation, it was um, anti-inflammation. The coagulation system was affected. So this, the concept that we're now working with is much broader. It's that sepsis is a dif dysfunctional immune response to infection. And these are the criteria, again. I'm sure you recognize these too. Sears um, was the criteria, uh, 
and I right now blank out. It's a systemic inflammatory response syndrome, and that's, of course, as we all know, the temperature, the respiratory rate, heart rate, and um, white blood count. And these were the criteria for sepsis um, back in the first sepsis one and two. But today we're working with the SOFA score, the sepsis or sequential organ failure assessment score. And this is something that was very much used in and is used in the intensive care units where this was very functional. This is not as functional for us and doesn't really help us in the first hour. So this is a bit of a problem using these criteria for us, and they won't, I suggest, help us really in the sepsis, the identification of the septic patient. So let's shift gears a little bit. This is Sharzad Kiavash. This is an amazing person. She went from, in 2012, being completely healthy, and within a few hours, she was dying of sepsis. And as you See, she's a sepsis survivor, and she also had to have part of her legs amputated because of this condition. But she went on to compete in triathlon, and she came in fourth in the Paralympics 2015. Truly amazing person. And she is the red berry. This is the more common face of sepsis. This is typically an older person. Somebody comes to the emergency department with nonspecific, vague symptoms. These are our blueberries, and this is a problem. Sepsis has an extremely high mortality rate. Per definition, it's above 10 percent and up to like 40, 45 percent in septic shock. And we know it's a time-critical condition, which means that we need to treat the patient early on, and time to treatment will affect patient outcome. And this is a problem because in emergency care, that is in the ambulance and emergency departments, we only recognize one in four of patients, one, four, one in four of the septic patients. We're missing three. Big problem. And this is also important for another reason, and that is that most of the patients with sepsis come through the emergency department, 80 percent. So we, everybody sitting here, have a huge responsibility here. We also gain a lot of experience in recognizing and caring for these patients. So more than half of these patients that come to our emergency departments come via the ambulance. They tend to be older and sicker. And it's also shown that the time to treatment is reduced when the ambulance alerts the emergency department that this patient may have sepsis. And this led us to design the PREDICT sepsis study. And leading up to this study, we did two important things. One, we could show that by using a screening tool, actually any tool, we could increase the identification of the septic patient. And we also became more interested in symptoms, because one out of three patients with sepsis has normal, near-normal vital signs. It's another problem. So not picked up by our triage systems. So again, back to this interest for symptoms, and I thought I'd just present to you some of the results so you, I'm, so you all have this, and I'm sure this will um, trigger recognition. Fever. Fever is common, yes, but a third of the patients, as you see, will not have fever, which is kind of tricky. Altered mental status is anything from an agitated patient to somebody that is deeply unconscious. Breathing. This, is, um, this can be a compensatory hyperventilation, but it can also be a common expression of the um, pulmonary infection which is common. Gastrointestinal symptoms, vomiting, diarrhea, can easily be mistaken for um, gastroenteritis. Weakness, weakness of the legs, the 35 percent there, is very common in older people. And this is typical that the older person will say, somebody who's been able to be up, about, take care of him or herself, they're walking, and suddenly they can't get out of bed, can't get out of their chairs, etc. So this is something to think about. But it can also be a more general fatigue, tired, lack of energy. 
pain. Pain can point to an infection focus, but it can also be more also diffuse in general. Okay, so the predict sepsis study. What did we do? So we included patients in the ambulance with infection according to、um, clinical judgment by ambulance. I wasn't even close to that. Anyway, by ambulance personnel,、um, and we also and we also had a group of patients without infection, and then we registered symptoms, vital signs, and took blood tests. And the outcome measures on the left there is、um, infection. With and without sepsis, and neither of the above. And our results are like this. It ends with three sepsis screening tools. These are not validated, but they're there. And I think what's striking is that they're fairly simple.、Um, so it's a history of altered mental status, gastrointestinal symptoms, systolic blood pressure、um, below 100. Um, altered mental status measured as GCS,、uh, temperature, important, and、uh, lactate. And then going to the sepsis two, what we did is we pooled the GCS、um, with the、um, history of altered mental status and took out lactate and have the same、um, accuracy. And then we have the third one containing only vital signs, which I initially condemned, but anyway, and.、Um, But I want a little caveat: is that these are calculated vital signs, so we're not using any other triage tool or something like that. Cutoffs.、Um, here we have a very good sensitivity around 90%, poor, ac-、uh, poor、um, specificity, and an area under the curve about 0.77, something like that. So the next step, what we did is we took this into the lab. And ask the question: By adding biomarkers, do we increase the predictive power of these sepsis screening tools? Can we do that? So we looked at circulating proteins and some gene expression, and asked that question. And to cut to the chase, without talking about methodology, is nah, that didn't help so much actually. But we did learn a couple of things on the way.、Um, we think the explanation is. That the molecular markers are already represented in what we could measure in the ambulance, the vital signs, and very much we saw that levels of biomarkers are strongly correlated to, say, temperature. Another thing that we think is really interesting with this study is that there's consistently a group of patients that are miscategorized, and this leads us to the thought of that. Again, like I said initially, that sepsis is a syndrome that we can't treat each other differently, not even when we're talking about sepsis identification. So that's an important message, I think. So where are we going? Where is the future? Automated sofa score. This is something that colleagues have been working on for years in Stockholm. I don't know if so I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. The principle there is that the sofa score is part of the. You know, you don't see it, but it's part of the IT system. It takes the habitual sofa score, and if there's a change, it's registered. And if the, and the change is two or more, it's somehow notified or red flagged. And it will be interesting to talk with you, some of you later on, if you think this is helpful or not.、Um, although this is helpful, again, sofa score is a criteria. It's difficult. For us in the ED to use this as early identification, AI is going to solve all our problems.、Um, yeah, I think for sure AI is coming, and we all know this. And it's used in different parts of the healthcare, and it's increasing. But the, I think one essential problem we are facing in relation to AI is that it requires really good healthcare data. Valid healthcare data, which and a delivery of from our e-health records that most e-health records don't match, and we're going to have some talks on that. So later on in the conference, so it'd be interesting to hear what you guys say about that. And the first publication in related in relation to AI and sepsis came out 2011, so more than 10 years ago, and still we haven't really drawn any advantage from it in clinical use. Again, back to that. 
Precision medicine, for sure a buzzword and something really important. And what is that really? It's to tailor the treatment to the individual patient. And I think that this requires two things. Two things, it requires that we understand the patient, the host, better. And that's what I'm talking about, understanding groups or individuals. And we can call that phenotyping of the patient. And then the next step is also immune profiling, that is understanding the microbe, what it is that causes um, the, the sepsis infection. And I think these three steps that I've just mentioned, they are for sure coming. Uh, they require advanced technology, And this is not available in all countries. And I see this as a big problem, because sepsis is a global killer. Okay. And with this introduction, I'd like to hand over the floor to Eric Malmström, who's a researcher and an emergency physician in training in Lund. Eric. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Lisa. Let's see. Yep. Uh, see if you can fiddle with that. I'll let you do it. All right. Yeah, some of them. I'm hit on the Just close it down. I think, or maybe you can just go to here and open it up. It's a little non responsive. Then that's on Hela vägen på Hurgal. So then you can open it Jag ser inte här. Kan du... Mm. Den är jättesvår, den här lilla. Ja, precis. Men det är antingen en del. Det är den. Sporten. We're talking about high tech here. Var är den? Den är där. Den är långt sen. Ja, där är den. Nej, nej. Tryck på den här borten. Stäng den. Och sen så nu är vi på banan och så trycker vi bara på bildvisning. Här går jag där bara. Tappa. Ja, vi har, vi har nog läst det här, tror jag. All right. Thank you, Lisa. And first, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Um, I'm my first sweet conference, and I'm very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Eric. I am doing my residency in the emergency department in Lund, um, second, third year, roughly. And I've been working in the sepsis research field for around 10 to 15 years. I did my PhD studies in Department of Infectious Diseases at Lund University, focused on host pathogen interaction with uh, mass spectrometry analysis. And after my internship, I did an international postdoc in Amsterdam at Professor van der Tom's lab. And at the moment, I'm trying to combine my sepsis research in a emergency medicine context. So technically, any pathogen can cause sepsis. And it happens when a localized infection spreads systemically and can cause an unbalanced host response that end up damaging the host itself. It's a common disease. We see it on a day-to-day -day basis in the emergency department. If you look globally, it's been estimation around 50 million cases annually. Uh, it's associated with high mortality. A little bit difference between different studies, but we're talking about the mortality rate between 15 to 25 percent. If we're talking absolute numbers, around 9 to 11 case death, million deaths per year. And even if you do survive the acute phase within this population, there's an increased long-term morbidity and mortality. All right. So uh, just a little bit, 2016, as Lisa talked, there were new definitions. So now sepsis, according to the sepsis three criteria, is an organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. Organ dysfunction is defined as an increased SOFA score of two points from the baseline. And you use the SOFA score as just an estimation of organ dysfunction, a numeric score. And within the sepsis definition, you have a subgroup called septic shock which is uh, when you have profound circulatory and metabolic abnormalities that is associated with a higher mortality and is defined as a persisting hypotension where you need vasopressors to maintain a MAP over 65 and an elevated serum lactate despite adequate fluid resuscitation. 
So despite intensive research, sepsis remains a major challenge, uh, both from a research perspective and in the clinic. Um, from a research perspective, within the sepsis-3 criteria, there's no definition of the underlying infection, which makes it hard to compare uh, different studies. The SOFA score is not compatible with treatment in the emergency department. And in the clinic, you know, it could be tricky to diagnose. It's associated with unspecific symptoms. We lack proper diagnostic tools that can discriminate between inflammation and infection. And we, lack, we still lack sepsis treatment today. We still rely on the strain strategies like we implemented like 30 years ago. We're talking about antibiotics, source, calls, and source control if necessary, and supportive care of organ dysfunction. And it's not because the field hasn't tried. They've been conducted over 100 clinical phase two, phase three trials, and all have failed. And there have been numerous studies showing promising results in preclinical environments, and, when you, and it's been extremely difficult to translate this into a clinical setting. And the same goes with the biomarkers. I've roughly looked at uh, PubMed, and there have been 178 proposed biomarkers in sepsis, and none lack the sensitivity and specificity we would like to have today in the clinic. So why is this so difficult? I think one explanation is that within the sepsis-3 criteria, it doesn't capture the heterogeneity of the disease and the underlying complex pathophysiology. This image is just to illustrate the complexity, but it is important to understand that the interaction between the host and the pathogen drives the disease, and properties of both the host and, and the pathogen will influence the outcome. We're talking about which bacteria, virulence factors, bacterial load, site of infection, if we go to the host, genetic background probably, um, treatment, comorbidity, and so forth. And when you do have an unbalanced immune response, it will activate several different biological processes, both pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory, that will activate simultaneously and then change rapidly over the disease progression. So this kind of one-size-fits-all strategy is not working. In addition, there's emerging data that sepsis on a molecular level consists of subtypes. Uh, this is one of Tom's, one of the earlier papers where they collected leukocytes from the ICU patient with sepsis to characterize them using RNA-seq and using unsupervised clustering. It ended up in subgroups based on different molecular expression. Um, this has been repeated in different studies. We can correlate it to site of infection, disease progression, and so forth, but we lack in-depth understanding what drives these potential subtypes. So what the field needs, it needs to move into a more precision medicine strategy. Just to put it simply, we need to find within the sepsis population, we need to identify subgroups that has the same underlying pathophysiological mechanism. And we need to target that mechanism in some way, some kind of treatment. And how do we do this? This is difficult. So obviously we need to measure the underlying biological processes uh, and we need to somehow link it to a clinical parameter or a clinical phenotype. On the other hand, we need a system to evaluate treatment effects. We need to understand in depth on a molecular level how a given drug targets the host and if the, that target overlaps with the underlying pathophysiological mechanism. And how should we do this? Well, I think we need, I think you should split it up in two ways, a data-driven strategy and a more hypothesis-driven strategy. The data-driven, you need huge clinical cohorts that captures the heterogeneity and different clinical aspects. You probably need serial samples that targets the disease progression, and you probably need follow-up after the acute phase, and we need to determine on molecular level what is happening. So since we don't know what we're looking for, we're probably going to need an unbiased strategy, some kind of high through technology that we can target different molecules, and then we do have that, we need to link this together. So some kind of, I think machine learning is an option where we can link the molecular readout with the clinical phenotype and then find the underlying molecular drivers. On the other hand, because of the complexity of disease, we need a model system where we can reduce the complexity and study one factor, 
like an animal model, or actually we're a model system where we can evaluate the treatment effects on a molecular level. And then we use to you a, you know, a technology that can transfer information between the species on a molecular level. And it probably has to be in the blood compartment because that's the blood samples or the um, sample we use today. So this is, you need an extensive research uh, network to do this. Uh, this is partly in place in Lund. We have, in, we have close collaboration between the emergency department and the clinical infectious diseases, even ICU. We need information about the underlying infections. So of course we need to work with the department, the microbiology department. We also need to collaborate with the preclinical environment, with animal models, with the technology that we can target um, using mass spec or uh, NDS or similar, and obviously bioinformaticians that can help us control this vast amount of data and probably some kind of machine learning tools. So which technology is available? Well, due to recent advances, this is actually a viable option. There are these high throughput techniques, the prices has gone down, time to prep them and to run them has goes down, and there are many different types of next gen uh, high throughput technologies that allows you to target different types of molecules. We're talking about NDS, next generation sequencing, when you look at DNA or RNA, you can target lipid or metabolites. However, if you want to study plasma and plasma proteome, it has to be some kind of antibody-based strategy or mass spectrometry-based proteomics. And that's the technology that I've been working with for the last 10 years, maybe. It's a very dynamic and intriguing technology. It allows you to target 10,000 proteins simultaneously, but at the same time look at specific degradation products, peptides. You can look at protein-protein interaction, you can look at post-translational modification, um, and even a single cell level right now. So you can use it in any type of experiment as long as it has proteins. So just a schematic overview. This is any given biological sample that has proteins. You extract the protein pool, you degrade it into peptides, separate it using a liquid chromatography, and you detect the peptides using a mass spectrometer. And we use a technology that generates a digital proteome map. So for each experiment, for each hypothesis, you generate this digital proteome map that you collect over time. And if you do more clinical studies or uh, experiment, you can collect this in kind of what we call a digital archive, a compendium of proteome maps that allow you to compare on molecular level differences between different outcomes and experiments. So uh, first, now I'll talk about four projects that briefly touches around this strategy. Um, so first, um, Paper one, we're in this kind of area of strategy. We wanted to use mass spectrometry to see if we could determine uh, organ dysfunction using mass spectrometry analysis in marine plasma. Um, first, we, that's a hallmark of sepsis pathology. Plasma is intriguing because it reflects systemic changes within the host. Uh, we wanted to use a model system where we could control certain aspect of the disease time, pathogen, and so forth. And we wanted to use a technology that to target multiple biological processes at the same time. And the problem with plasma though, it contains a lot of protein and it's dynamic, it changes and is highly influenced by the surrounding organs and cells. So to first of all understand organ damage and see if this actually influences the plasma proteome, you need to have detailed understanding of the surrounding organs and cells. So we went to genetically identical mice, bulb C. We harvest organs and leukocytes and different cell types. We analyzed them using mass spectrometer analysis, generating these proteome maps. And this is just a heat map showing protein expression across the different organs and cells. So each line, it's a protein, red is high abundant. And if you just eyeball it, you can appreciate that each organ and cell type has a fairly unique expression pattern. And then we in-depth looked into healthy mouse plasma. Um, each bar here in this circle, it's a protein identified in plasma. So you, we found roughly 1,000 proteins. And then we superimposed the information around the expression, protein expression across the different organ and cells. And if we do this, kind of a pattern emerges here. So you have pink, 
pink color here are proteins that are primarily exist in plasma. Here is a little bit of yellow, that's proteins that are primarily produced in the liver and so forth. So we thought that we could use this information to understand changes, underlying changes in the plasma proteome. We went to our infection model, we took the same type of mice, we inoculated them with the bacteria in a dose response experiment. So healthy mice here, and then increased the amount of bacteria and we euthanized them after uh, 48 hours. And weight loss is a proxy for disease severity and the mouse group with the highest bacteria load lost the most weight and it goes gradually up to healthy. So they were fun in the way we kind of thought. And then we harvest, collected the plasma, and we determine the plasma proteome using mass spectrometry analysis. So this is just uh, proteins in plasma and how they change throughout the disease. These are the different groups, and this is an average pick of the combination of these ones. As you see here, this is one group that gradually goes up with disease severity. We have a group of protein that goes down in response to infection, and then the last one here. We have a group of protein that just pops up in the most severely ill animals. And when we use the human mouse atlas, we see that these are mainly tissue-based proteins, indicating that we can use this strategy to target organ dysfunction. Uh, and, but still, this is a model system. We wanted to move into whether or not we could look at treatment effects. Again, we needed a system that we could control. We used mice model again. And the aim was to determine treatment effects on a molecular level using a combination of mass spectrometry analysis and an infection model. So to determine treatment effects, you need to have in-depth understanding of the sepsis proteome response, which protein changes throughout the disease. So the study outline was as followed. We used first an infection model. This is E. coli model, IP. We harvest, uh, euthanized the animal at different time points, harvest organ, characterize the protein expression, and then we repeated the model here, but we added different treatment at different time point. Here we choose a, 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 a treatment with different mechanism, an antimicrobial therapy, meropenem, or methylprednisolone, which has an anti-inflammatory properties. So, the initial characterization, we, we did the animal model, we harvest the organs at 6, 12, and 18 hours. We characterize the underlying protein using mass spectrometry analysis. And we see here, different colors here are the different organs. The bars are the numbers of proteins identified, and roughly we found 8,000 proteins you know, across the different organs and cells throughout the disease. And if we zoom in a little bit to the response pattern here, these are protein that changes due to the infection. So these are, mod and roughly that was around two or 3,000 protein changes within the host. The color here are the different organs. The bar is the time point is relatively to health. So this is six, 12, 18. And the ones that are up here are upregulated. And the one that goes down are downregulated. So if you just zoom in and eyeball this, you see two types of expression. One kind of general across the different organs and upregulation of proteins and a more specific response in the leukocyte liver and the spleen where you see more downregulation pattern. And we see that the proteome changes over time and we see that each organ has its unique response to the infection. This is a heat map. The color indicates the different organs, white to gray at different time points. These are proteins and the red is upregulated proteins, blue are downregulated. And if you just eyeball this again, you see that each organ has within the response a unique response pattern. Just to sum up, sepsis introduced a time dependent in its organotypid and then generated a massive immune activation and damage response within the organs. And finally, to determine the effects of the treatment, we repeated the model. We used a combination of different treatment. This is uh, time point two hours and eight hours, early or late, and we first introduced anti-inflammatory treatment, and then we followed by antimicrobial treatment, and then a combination of the two, where you see first an early anti-inflammatory treatment, followed by late antimicrobial treatment, and then late anti-inflammatory and late antimicrobial treatment. And if you just zoom in the result, these are actual bacteria detected in the heart, which is a proxy of the amount of bacteria is a proxy of disease severity. So, Untreated mice here 
have high levels of bacteria. Anti-inflammatory properties obviously increase the bacterial load. When we use anti antibiotics, never let antibiotic went down. But the combination treatment differ. So interestingly, when we introduced early anti-inflammatory treatment followed by late antimicrobial treatment, it was deleterious for those that had a lot of bacteria and an increased weight loss. However, if we do the same treatment, except the same concentration, but introduce the anti-inflammatory treatment six hours later, the results were opposite, indicating that early in the response, the hosts need a proper immune response to combat the bacteria, whereas later, when you have probably more an un unbalanced host response, antimicrobial uh, anti-inflammatory anti treatment is beneficial, indicating that there is treatment windows within sepsis. And finally, this for this one is um, we wanted to measure the effects of molecular level. Which molecules do this treatment actually target? So again, this is a little bit complicated. So let me walk you through this. So when you introduce sepsis, a protein can change from its healthy state up or down. If it do, it ends up here on the green line here. And if we introduce treatment, the proteins, one, any given protein can respond to stay the same or return back to healthy state. Then we we postulate that this is good and some kind of effect of the treatment. If a given protein respond, surprisingly tricky, this one here, go, it reverts back to this line here, purple. And then third, third option, we see a group of proteins that don't change throughout the disease, but actually changes due to the treatment itself. It ends up red here. To sum up, this is the kidney. Uh, with uh, anti-inflammatory treatment early. We analyzed the changes within the proteome, and the treatment did not have barely any effect on the proteins here. It goes with a green line, but it was a small side effect notice. However, antimicrobial treatment in leukocytes basically reverted back the whole proteome, so they responded to this treatment. And then you can get a kind of quantification, how many percent of the proteins respond, to this, and then you add up the different treatment variabilities, different organs, you end up with this massive matrix, and you can roughly kind of quantify the response pattern due to a specific treatment on a molecular level. So again, using this metal, we can target treatment effects on a molecular level, and apparently in this model, this time and treatment combination influence the treatment response. Problem is that these are mice, it's not human, they are fundamentally different, so we need to work with human beings to understand sepsis. So, again, we wanted to do this, we had the same aim to determine organ dysfunction using mass spectrometry analysis, however, to do this you need characterize the underlying organ and cells. So we had an extensive collaboration with the surgical department at Lund University, we were able to collect the biopsies from 18 different tissues and we cell sorted eight different cell types from three patients or from three healthy donors. Um, we generally analyze them with mass spectrometry analysis and we generate these proteome maps, roughly identifying nine, almost 10,000 protein. Um, just to show you a little bit, um, here's the heat map of the protein expression across the different organs. Red is indicate uh, high abundance, and if you just look at it, it you can see, um, appreciate at least that the cells and the tissue has a fairly unique expression pattern. And the final part of, yeah, and then this is one strategy, one patient, it could be in the, you know, highly influenced by that given individual, so we wanted to make a stronger definition model, so we downloaded three other atlases as well. This is young cell paper where they have a protein and an RNA atlas, and then we used MEL open target to download that one. And then we compared the molecular expression throughout the four different atlases and ended up with a consensus atlas. Meaning that if all the atlases indicate that a given protein is expressed in, for example, the liver, we have high confidence in that. If it's one out of four, we don't believe it as much. And it works fairly okay. This is just to illustrate. This is pancreas. These proteins are deemed to be pancreas specific. This is protein, protein expression across the different organs, and you see they tell a similar thing in these four atlases. And the final step here, we wanted to target plasma, and we wanted to use plasma with different underlying pathophysiology. 
uh, here. This is just a proof of concept, not a study. So we, we collected plasma from patients with pancreatitis, 10 of them with an elevated amylase, and then we collected 14 patients that were admitted to the ED at Lund University Hospital, but chest pain, but with no pancreatitis. And when we, we collected the plasma and we analyzed it with mass spectrometry analysis. So this is a UMAP. I hope you can appreciate their different colors. Orange here is patient pancreatitis. Blue is a control. And when you do a UMAP analysis, you take information from all the proteins identified in plasma, you reduce it to two dimension, and it localizes itself in the scatter plot, indicating that dots that are in close proximity have a you know, more similar uh, plasma proteome compared to one further away. So when we use, use this strategy, we can't separate pancreatitis patient and the control group. However, when we used our human atlas, we saw an influx of pancreatic specific proteins in the pancreatic group. And when we used that information, we were able to completely separate the two different groups, uh, indicating, so these are just to show up, these are the pancreatitis down there in the bottom and up there is the control group, indicating that we can use this strategy to target organ dysfunction and even underlying pathophysiological mechanism in sepsis. And then now we have a model system, we have detailed information of the molecular composition of man and mouse, which also allow us to compare these two species and transfer information in between. And in the final study, so we have talked about treatment strategies, biomarkers, but also other strategies to find sepsis early. And this is a sepsis alert. It's a modified triage system implemented in emergency departments in Sweden, and it will probably be part of a standardized care process. And at least in Skåne, it's best, uh, you use RETS, which is our triage system. And if you have a deviating vital parameter, according to RETS and a suspected infection, it is triggered as a sepsis alert. So it goes to the ED, is rapidly evaluated by emergency physician and its team, and then you have an ID physician as a consultant. Um, According in Sweden, in Lund at least, when we look at these numbers, so 80% of the population triggered as a sepsis alert actually reaches sepsis 3 criteria. However, if we look at all the patients that develop sepsis within 48 hours after admission, it only consists of 36%. So we do find a few, but we still miss this major part, the majority of potential sepsis patients. Anyway, we, we we have been collecting these patient samples over time in a biobank, and we're con currently conducting one of the largest mass spectrometry analysis studies on this patient group. Um, and hopefully, we can able to link the molecular, a certain molecular readout to a given clinical phenotype to start you know, identifying subgroup and improve stratification. This is just preliminary data. It's early in the study, but we have 1,379 potential sepsis patients here. Uh, we collected a vast amount of clinical data. We have the SOFA score, treatment, comorbidity, morbel, uh, mortality, level of care. And we also re-evaluated each patient whether, if, whether or not it has an underlying infection using uh, newly published infection criteria by Lynn Adam and Lisa. And this is just a preliminary heat map to show uh, Protein expression across different patients. If you just look at it, you see there are patterns just when look here. We don't know what that means, but hopefully we find something within this patient cohort. And then, of course, we work with people that do machine learning, where recently two algorithms have been developed. One is called Data Processing Kitchen Sink, which is a machine learning strategy to optimize biomarkers. The other one is called Biologically Informed Neural Network BIN, where you try to link molecular expression to a biological function, some kind of match, uh, inten enable intelligent pathway analysis. So hopefully we can use this strategy to link molecular readout to a clinical phenotype. We would like to use the human atlas to define underlying pathological mechanism. And hopefully this could be a start to better certification and somewhat precision medicine strategy in sepsis. And I do believe 
this this type of strategy is, is, is happening all around in different um, labs and, and clinical studies now. So I do think the combination of high throughput techniques and machine learning, uh, I think will take us towards a precision medicine strategy within the sepsis field. Um, obviously, this is a team effort. There was a lot of people involved in these different projects. Uh, I'd like to thank Adam Linda, Lisa, Department of Infection Medicine. They have done tremendous work with the sepsis alert cohort. Uh, you one here is the mass spec guy. Lars, Aaron, Eric are our bioinformatician and AI people. And then uh, thanks to the surgical department for all the help with the tissue biases. Special thanks to Emma who facilitated this. And obviously I'd like to thank Ulf Ekelund for supporting me when I started my emergency training in Lund. Eric Driver, my clinical supervisor, he's great, and in the end, all my, all my colleagues in the ED that you know, makes it a special workplace. Thanks for listening, guys, and if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them. Right, so I, is this on? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can start. So how do you envision this being used? I can see like finding different protein, yeah. proteins that you can, you can see in the blood and then, okay, now is the trigger to start. This Pro kind of probably, thing. right, you need, um, um, otherwise you link it to a clinical parameter that we can measure easily or it has to be based on a molecular readout. So if you give a certain drug, you need to you know, make sure that it actually, that candidate or whatever it is, is, is upregulated or present at that moment, I think. I think this is, but I think the technology will make this a lot easier. I think we're probably gonna use a, a panel of biomarkers that will reflect certain biological processes or dysfunction. Um, and based on that, that will probably guide the therapy. Um, I like the technology is obviously not there yet, but we know, I think in 10 years it could be actually, I will see. Okay, uh, thank you for an interesting uh, lecture. Uh, I was, I had a question about uh, sepsis alert. Uh, yeah. Do you have any data on uh, sepsis mor mortality uh, since you introduced that? And, uh, oh, in, in that group? Uh, yes, and uh, uh, what adverse effects are you measuring uh, on the patients well, as a whole? Well, I, we haven't in-depth characterized everything yet. I think the mortality is it's in line with what we've seen in other studies. I think it's 20 Twenty percent, maybe a reduction. No, 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 it, no. We don't. We don't see a reduction in mortality with the strategy. Okay. And then, and so no, we don't see in mortality now. But we reduce time to antibiotics has been proven. Um, this was implemented before. We're just you know studying mm -hmm. the cohort right now. But the alert, sepsis alert strategy do not mm -hmm. affect mortality. But what what's the purpose of it? Uh, well, well the, the purpose was to identify sepsis early and start treatment. Um, but the problem is that there was kind of implemented already in Lund to some extent before it was implemented. So it's a sub comparison, I think, regarding mortality. But the general idea is to, to find it earlier and improve mortality. But there's no study to show now that, it, that it's, it's reducing mortality, actually. Okay, thank you. Hmm? That was <laughs> um, okay, so just I would like to comment on the, your question on the sepsis alert and how this has evolved a little bit because I think it's important that the emergency medicine community understands this. This is part of uh, standardizing care in line with all these national programs that we're doing in Sweden. Maybe I should stand up. Um, and this group that worked with this sepsis alert is was very much it was. I mean, I was in it, actually. Um, and uh, there's other people working in emergency care. There's also infectious medicine, which was very strong in this group. And this is I, this is Lisa's perception now, is very much a drive from infectious medicine. But, and, I, and it was very much also based, you had Rules and Quist, two studies. And those studies she showed, and this was locally in Skåne, yeah. Malmö, right? Malmö, yeah. primarily. And she could show that they could move treatment earlier but there was 
in a selected group. I mean, I think that is the key. In a selected group of patients that already today come in as our highest priority level. And this is the problem, me and my red and blue berries. That's, we're still working with the red berries all the time. And, I, and to me, I think my interpretation is that that is the problem. These patients are already red. So we already treat them immediately. But she could show that there was uh, still earlier antibiotics and tests, I think, blood tests and stuff like that. Yeah. But no mortality change. I think because, be again, we're already treating them like as fast as we can. We and do stay in a hospital, I think, was one parameter yeah, that, that, maybe. that was positive, maybe. but not But mortality. just, uh, let's see, I had one more comment, which I now forgot mm -hmm. to that. I think, why is this important was your question. And I mean, kind of, and I think, I've been kind of critical, I hear, of what I've said, which I have been and in this discussion in the group, too. But I do think what it does, it, is, it does standardize the care in Sweden, and, and that is a positive thing in itself. And, and I think that's an important thing to do. I guess that's it. Yeah. But uh, we still need to identify our blueberries. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I have a question for you, Lisa. I didn't understand the um, predict sepsis screening tool, the three ones. Yeah. Uh, which one do you use, or have you seen different um, areas of um, uh, well, there are actually, situations when you use? They're not, so they're not in clinical use. No. That's a problem. And what we were going mm. for was a high sensitivity because we think that it's important that we recognize these patients. So with the high sensitivity, you have a good impact on recognition, like identifying them. And then we, as emergency physicians, we, when we're experienced, we have a really good specificity. So if you trigger, ooh, this might be sepsis, then you get an experienced clinician there, and then you have com combine that with a high specificity. And we were also going for um, that this should be fairly simple to implement. Again, back to that we don't think that today we're not ready for all this high throughput, high technology and all that stuff, but we wanted a fairly simple algorithm. And that's where we were going. So are you using one more or are you still trying after three months? Uh, no, but this is a result, and it hasn't been clinically implemented. So this is where we're at. And then our next step was this thing to see if we'd add with some um, more the mechanistic aspect, adding on these biomarkers that we know are involved, and uh, which uh, didn't help. But our understanding was that that was because it, all the information was already in the clinical, um, what we could measure in the ambulance. And did you see any time, I'm sorry, any time difference from, from our perspective, um, working up north, yeah. uh, having uh, time to come into the hospital? Exactly. Uh, an hour or two or more. Can you see any time change having that put into these? Um... Yeah, that's a really good question, this thing with time. I think that's super important because we did the study in the ambulance because that is our first in emergency care, as you all know, it's our first uh, physical contact with the patient. So we thought that that was as early as we can get um, in that sense. But as you say, Patients um, in old age homes and others, they can have been sick for days or sometimes even longer, maybe even a week or even two sometimes actually. And they have this like very low uh, grade infection and presentation. And uh, so, but we sadly don't have a time perspective. I mean, our time perspective is everything we did, uh, the vitals and, and the blood tests and the symptoms were in the ambulance. So we call that as early as we can, but I think it'd be super interesting to, to understand, but it's really hard to say because we do have a patient delay here be, before they approach um, um, medical care, and we don't know when they actually started to get sick. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now you get it back. All right, uh, it's maybe more more comment. I think that sepsis discussion highlights our problem in emergency medicine, what happened when the sepsis guidelines or the sepsis program came to us. In my department, we have like five, at least five ambulance alerts, a shift, which is called sepsis alarm, as a sepsis alert. And who comes in? They are like basically patients who are since maybe a year or two years back in the process of dying. 
And what we what do we do to these patients? They come in, they have a little bit of fever, or they may have a little bit mentating, the mentation is a little bit down, and then we torture them. We put in lines, we put in catheters, and I think the sepsis discussion highlights a problem where subspecialists or specialists dictate with good intentions their ideas to a generalist specialty. So the next thing that comes is like the cold leg. There is a special work program where everybody who comes in has a little bit of cold leg and you have to put in place all this stuff, then geography, da, 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 da. and then maybe there comes the, uh, I don't know what comes, you know, something will come. Uh, and, and what I miss in all these, these uh, programs is like a holistic view on what patient do we treat, which I think we as the emergency physicians see all the time. And sometimes when they come in with this ambulance alert and I'm there like as a, yeah, a little bit older, uh, and as a senior backing up the juniors, I sometimes think, well, actually, we shouldn't do anything with this patient. We should let them die in the sepsis because that's quite a good death, you know. Instead, we put the needles in, we give them like, I think emergency physicians, I feel sometimes know only two antibiotics. It's the pip Piptazo and it's the uh, Cefotaxim and then maybe the Gentamicin. And unfortunately, I feel like if you consult an, an infectious disease doctor, they only know these two because if you ask them, they're like, oh, shouldn't I go down and like, don't use the broad spectrum. And they say, oh, no, no, just to be on the safe side, give the broad spectrum, you know? And I kind of, I mean, you as researchers, I don't know if you heard that. And then you have a comment like, and tell me, well, we're thinking about that aspect of uh, sepsis care, but that's like my big, like almost every second sepsis alert, I'm feeling like what I'm doing to this patient here. It's like. Can I, is this on? Yeah. Can I comment on that? I love that comment. Thank you, Jarold. Um, actually, there is an aspect in this, what we're supposed to measure. And there's, um, so this guideline of the sepsis alert, the national guideline now, um, which I think we should be very critical of, um, it has one of these, how you follow up and measure the patient is how many patients that have um, limited care orders in their medical records. Now, this is put in there as a follow-up indicator, and it's going to be super hard to actually measure because we usually don't um, document this very well. But I think what you're saying is super important. But I think at the same time, a um, couple comments that, I mean, we still don't recognize three out of four patients. so the, so we're still missing a lot of patients that have a lot of life ahead of them. And it's not just old people. It is people of all ages, also including children. So we do need to understand the condition. And I think, as the physician, my take is it understand, okay, sepsis, fine. Sepsis, okay. But then you have to look, patient, context. And as you say, our job is to incorporate all these different things. Um, what did the patient want him or herself? What is their attitude to what we should do in relation to different resuscitations, treatments, and things like that? But to understand that the patient has sepsis at the time will, for me, help my clinical judgment and help also me in relation to talking to the patient to be able to inform them so that they can better take a stand in where they're at and what they want. So I think it, to me, this is how I see it, what you say is super duper important, and I think it's how we always should act as physicians, that we have to think of what's best for the patient all the time. But we, to do that, I think we need to understand um, what's going on. Uh, hi, my name's Julia. Here. Hi. <laughs> uh, just a, a general question. You mentioned that sepsis has different phases, uh, can be divided into different subgroups. So one of my two questions is, can you talk a bit more about that? Um, my, so the second question relates to, um, can you adjust the sepsis criteria 
not only to vital parameters, but more to the patient characteristics like beta blockers. Um, so the most the, the, the sickest patients I've had in recent years were middle-aged people walking in with on beta blockers and then totally crushing, but not crushing before my eyes, just within a week or so. But they would not alert any sepsis alarm because they were surprisingly uh, normal in their in their vital parameters. Exactly. Um, so if, if you want... Um, to expand detection. on that. Detection. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Early detection. It, I, I, my first thought is that vital parameters don't tell the truth. They don't, yeah. Um, can you talk about... Yeah, I can com yeah. comment yeah, that a little bit. Just, if you just give a short answer, because we run a bit out of okay. time. So uh, we can, uh, uh, whoever's we interested, can we can keep talking afterwards. Keep talking as afterwards. you understand, this is one of my favorite topics. And I'm sure Eric would like to comment this also. But briefly, a third of the patients have uh, with sepsis have normal vital signs. And that's why we were so interested in this thing with symptoms. And there's a recent paper from, and see my recent, from 2019, by Seymour, who classifies patients based on lots of things, lots of clinical information, lots of this advanced stuff and also can characterize them in four different phenotypic categories like symptom presentation, like typically the old patient that's just like petering along, and then the young, younger patient that's very inflammatory and super sick and has a high mortality and stuff like that. So I think that one answer to your question is that we need to really think about this and also characterize the patient based on presentations, because we as clinicians, I'm sure everybody in the room sees that they act differently. It's different presentations, and I think this will be really interesting to study in a systematic fashion, and to my knowledge it hasn't been done. Yeah. So we can talk more if that wasn't an answer to your question. <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, um, uh, thank you. Did, did, I, did they actually get an applaud? They didn't. I.